event. This is the first time we've hosted uh, a roundtable of this sort. It's very similar to a senatorial hearing uh, and obviously done remotely. And uh, I really appreciate your working with us on this. So thank you for taking the time. Uh, you know, one of the most uh, overstated uh, lines that we hear these days is the unprecedented nature of, of uh, the times we're living in. Of course, it's true. Uh, we've never before chosen to close down the American economy. There is no playbook, no plan on the shelf for how to reopen it. Um, I think it is, however, useful to begin by remembering why we closed our economy in the first place. Uh, it wasn't because we thought we would kill the virus uh, by doing so. I think the main reason that we closed down our economies and instituted stay-at-home policies uh, virtually everywhere in the country was because we wanted to slow down the rate of transmission of the virus so as to avoid a surge of victims that would be so great that it would overwhelm the capacity of our hospitals. I think that was really the main reason that we closed everything down. And that made sense at the time. And fortunately, in most of the country, including my home state of Pennsylvania, it's now clear that there is little or no risk that we're gonna overwhelm the capacity of our hospitals. Having said that, the shutdown has imposed a massive cost. This is a healthcare cost, it's an economic cost, it's social costs. And we recognize that in Congress, in part by responding with the passage of legislation that directly spent almost $3 trillion, authorized the Federal Reserve to lend uh, what could end up being three or four trillion additional dollars. This is a staggering amount of money. It's on the order of a third of the entire American economy for a full year. And we did that in a matter of weeks. But I think it's really essential that we remember that massive government spending is no substitute for an economy. In fact, all of government necessarily depends on having an economy. And so uh, endless government spending is just not sustainable. And that brings us to why we're here today. Uh, the purpose of this roundtable is to discuss the importance of and strategies for reopening the American economy in a gradual, safe manner that emphasizes protection for the truly vulnerable populations. We all know that very much includes senior citizens and people with underlying health care problems and chronic conditions and compromised immune systems. Uh, but we also know that in many areas of the country, the transmission has been minimal or has declined dramatically. And there are precautions that we can take now that are well known and well defined that can help to keep people safe. The kinds of measures that the CDC has provided guidance on, like social distancing and wearing masks and washing hands. Um, <clears throat> So with that said, um, I, I wanna uh, introduce our distinguished panelists uh, who have just a terrific range of expertise that I'm really looking forward to hearing. I'm going to uh, mention the names and backgrounds of all four of, of our panelists and then I will introduce them to speak uh, sequentially a moment later. Um, first, let me introduce uh, Dr. Mark McClellan. Uh, Dr. McClellan is the former administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. He was also a commissioner of the FDA. He's currently a professor of business, medicine, and policy, and the founding director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University. Uh, I, I'll go to him first uh, for our panel discussion in a few moments, uh, with, and, and I look forward to his thoughts on how he has helped advise Governor Abbott on the reopening in Texas. Next, we'll, have, we'll hear from Dr. Paul Romer, and I, I really appreciate Dr. Romer's uh, support for my efforts to encourage Pennsylvania to move in the direction of reopening. Dr. Romer is a professor of economics at New York University. He's a 2018 Nobel Prize winner in economic sciences, and he's gonna discuss the economic situation that we face in the United States and other strategies other than a universal lockdown that ought to be considered. Uh, from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, UPMC, the largest healthcare system in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Stephen Shapiro. Dr. Shapiro leads the Health Services Division as an Executive Vice President at UPMC. He also serves as the Chief Medical and Scientific Officer. Uh, 
And as a physician scientist, Dr. Shapiro remains active clinically and in the lab. We really look forward to hearing his boots on the ground experience throughout this pandemic and his advice on how healthcare systems can move forward. And lastly, we're very fortunate to have with us Dr. John Ioannidis from Stanford University. Dr. Ioannidis is a professor of medicine, epidemiology, and population health, as well as a professor, professor of courtesy of biomedical data science and statistics, co-director of the Meta Research Innovation Center at Stanford University, and he has done some groundbreaking work on understanding the prevalence of, of this virus. So again, thank you all very much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for this discussion and to help educate uh, my colleagues, myself, and the many people who are watching this online. Uh, I'll now recognize each of you for the purpose of your opening statements, and I'd like to begin with Dr. McClellan. Uh, Senator Toomey and colleagues, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to join you virtually today. I hope you can hear me uh, all right in this first uh, virtual effort. Um, I want to thank you for all of your efforts to try to contain this uh, unprecedented pandemic. As Senator Toomey mentioned at the opening, uh, we have taken effective steps to contain the initial surge, uh, but it has come at a huge economic cost. And I think as we go forward, a lot of people are framing the decisions here as an either or. Either uh, we can reopen the economy uh, or uh, we can contain the pandemic. I think it's very important for policies right now and in the coming days and weeks to focus on how we can effectively do both of those things. In fact, it's not going to be easy to sustain economic growth and economic recovery unless the public is confident that we are actually containing uh, the pandemic so that they can go about more of their normal activities under the new normal that we're living in today. Many states are taking steps to move in this direction, and I'm pleased that they've been guided by some of the work by uh, my colleagues, the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, as well as my colleague Scott Gottlieb uh, and other experts around the country, including those on the panel today. Uh, we've highlighted, as Senator Toomey did, the importance of having a health care system that has capacity not just for any potential surge in cases that may recur, but also for providing the kind of urgent and necessary care that many patients have had to do without. Ours have been disrupted in recent weeks. That kind of healthcare capacity is critical going forward. In addition, we've highlighted some of the steps that can help contain further spread of the pandemic as the country reopens. Many of these steps need to be taken by businesses across the country as they open under new kinds of practices to prevent the spread of uh, the virus among their customers and among their workers. Many steps need to be taken by Americans as they practice safe distancing, as they start going about more of their lives, uh, and also uh, take steps to stay home uh, if they have any symptoms related to COVID-19 and to get further further help in managing those, that, those uh, possible COVID-19 conditions. Um, and along with this, states are expanding their capacity to identify and contain further outbreaks. This is especially challenging because of the ease of spread of the virus and the frequency with which asymptomatic spread occurs. In our recent report on building a national test and trace and surveillance system, we highlighted four key areas for further efforts by states and the federal government, I'm pleased to see a lot of practice, a lot of progress in all of these dimensions. One of these is enhanced test and tracing capacity, uh, the ability to do widespread and reliable, accurate diagnostic testing in a timely way with sharing the results so that responses can happen quickly. Uh, this capacity is improving CDC's guidance on who should be tested in highest priority, and high priority has been revised and likely will continue to be revised. And it's important for states to try to ensure they can perform this level of testing in all regions of the state uh, as they reopen. Many state areas have been not very hard hit in those areas that should be relatively easy to put in place this kind of capacity because there are not very many active cases in the community. But just because an area hasn't had outbreaks before doesn't mean it's immune. We've seen outbreaks now in more than 80% of rural communities, for example, 
and many of them have been especially hard hit by outbreaks in so-called congregate settings like nursing homes and uh, food processing centers. Uh, second, along with the improved testing, uh, is improved syndromic surveillance. Because there is so much potential for asymptomatic spread, it's imp and because we don't have widespread testing reliably in place everywhere yet, it's important to continue to monitor outbreaks of respiratory symptoms and to augment that with additional testing uh, as it becomes available. So testing of asymptomatic individuals in high-risk settings like uh, nursing homes uh, and healthcare facilities, and perhaps testing in the community on a larger scale basis to detect potential early outbreaks, at least in areas where there, is, there are active cases, could be helpful as well. That's part of the ramp up of the testing and tracing capacity that I described before. Uh, third, I know there's a lot of interest from members of this committee and governors and other leaders around the country in the role of serologic testing, testing for antibodies for people who may now have immunity to COVID-19. Uh, the immunity is probably more widespread than we think since the cases have been more widespread uh, in our communities than testing so far has actually detected. So this could be an important complement to other activities to contain the spread of the virus as the country reopens. Um, much progress has been made in the last few weeks on toward developing more reliable serologic tests. They're not there yet, but steps by the Food and Drug Administration this week and by the Congress to support more reliable testing hold some promise for these activities in the months ahead. I would emphasize, though, that because most Americans have not been exposed to the virus and because the level of community immunity in most of the United States is relatively low, this won't be the only or perhaps the main approach to containing the pandemic in the months ahead as the country seeks to reopen successfully. And finally, I want to emphasize the importance of rapid response uh, to contain outbreaks when they occur. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to detect them earlier, and this contact tracing uh, and further steps to prevent spread will be relatively easy to implement. But this is an area that will require significantly more resources. It's been traditionally a public health function. I think for success going forward, it's going to have to be a combination of public health and our healthcare system. I'm glad that Dr. Shapiro is with us today. Many healthcare systems are taking leading roles in augmenting public health capabilities locally. CMS has taken new steps to support payments for healthcare providers in these regards. And we've identified some additional steps in a report released last week that we think CMS and other payers and the Congress could take to make it easier for healthcare systems to build up uh, these surveillance capabilities, these public health protection capabilities in conjunction with local public health settings. And finally, there will be an increasing role for businesses. Uh, businesses reopen in helping to make sure their employees and their customers take the right steps and get into appropriate uh, isolation or quarantine and testing uh, as needed. Thank you all very much for the opportunity to join you today. Thank you, Dr. McClellan. Dr. Romer, you are now recognized for five minutes. Good, well, thank you uh, so much for get, letting me participate in this forum and thank you for organizing it. I think one of our biggest challenges right now is to help people understand very complicated situation which is the uh, senator said is very new and unfamiliar and it is forcing us all to try and understand and to make decisions about how we move forward i wanted to start by explaining why i now support a plan for a hundred billion a year in spending on uh testing at population scale for for viral pathogens why i support that when a year ago i would definitely not have supported this um, in 2019, I would have said this was overkill, it's too expensive, it's too hard. What's changed is not that this plan is any more attractive, but our options are now dramatically worse. Um, we really only have two paths at the moment in the absence of uh, better testing and testing and tracing that I'll come back to. We really only have two paths forward. Uh, one is to accept this reproduction number at about one or greater than one, and to let the, the virus expand throughout the entire US population. Uh, the other is to fight constantly to keep R less than one. That obviously saves some deaths, saves some disease, 
but right now we're fighting it in a way which is so costly that it's not going to be sustainable. And I, I think we need to recognize that there's no point in fighting for a while and then giving up and letting the virus spread through the whole population. This does not reduce the number of lives. You incur extra economic cost. If we're going to conclude that we have to let it spread through the population, we should just do that now. Um, so what would happen if we, if we did that? The, the, the numbers are uncertain, but my sense is that the infection fatality rate is about half a percent, lower than we thought before. But if this virus spreads through the population and infects 60%, which is the kind of lower bound, I think, of most people's estimates of uh, what need for herd immunity, um, then we'll have about a million deaths. Now, as Senator Toomey emphasized, we used uh, the lockdown partly to keep from overwhelming our hospital systems. So if we're going to have a million deaths, uh, we will probably want to keep restricting things so that we don't get more than about 2,500 deaths a day. But then if you do the math, it means we'll be facing this high uh, rate of death for uh, 400 days, more than a year. Now, my guess is that this is going to have a significant depressing effect on economic activity. It's going to cause fear. As more people know someone who's died, uh, they'll hold back from the market. So this, this strategy of letting the virus spread through the population is not a quick path towards an economic recovery. And of course, it involves a really horrific uh, loss, of, loss of life. On the other hand, if we try to force R0 less than one, we'd have to do something that's even more effective than what we're doing right now, because all of our efforts to date have gotten us down to about one. Um, the, the only way, until we get a vaccine, the only way to get R0 down is to cont contain, to quarantine, to isolate people who are infected. The problem right now is we don't know who's infected, so we're trying to contain and isolate and limit the mobility of as many people as, as possible. And this is really causing enormous loss. We're, we're facing 500 billion a month in lost economic activity by containing people. And the prospect of containing people even more to get below R1, I, I think by this method is, is just not going to be acceptable to people. So the old alternative path is to figure out who is infected and just contain, isolate them. And we can do that through a couple of methods. One is population scale testing, test everybody. The other is to try and predict who's likely to be infected, then to focus your tests on those who are likely to be infected. Tracing is one of the ways you could predict, but there's some other ways to, to predict. Um, I, I think reasonable people can support both of these methods. I personally think the, the population scale testing is the one that, in a sense, we know how to do. We know how to do these tests. We know how to scale them out. The problem with predicting through something like contact tracing is it requires us to do things that we as a nation have, have never done. So um, I'm worried about that. And finally, I, I'm worried that that will not restore confidence because it depends too much on uh, trust in authorities. If if my dentist has been tested recently and I've been tested recently, we don't have to trust the authorities who are managing contact tracing. We just show each other our tests and I can then go get my teeth cleaned. And, and I think that confidence building aspect of letting everybody get tested, letting everybody show that they're not infected could be critical and the best hope for uh, a quick recovery. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Romer. Uh, Dr. Shapiro, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Senator Katumi and committee members for the opportunity to share with you a typical healthcare experience of COVID-19 through the lens of UPMC, whose hospitals span uh, urban, community, and rural areas, comprising the largest academic health system in the country and a health plan with 3.8 million subscribers. As we prepared for the pandemic, we radically transformed our hospital operations to create a safe environment for patients and staff. We delayed non-urgent surgery, reducing volume by 70%, and we scaled up telemedicine 38-fold, delivering 250,000 visits in April alone. We indeed saw a steady stream of patients, but never surged. At peak mid-April, 
COVID patients occupied 2% of our 5,500 hospital beds and 48 of our 750 ventilators. Subsequently, admissions have tapered, and now most of them are coming from nursing homes with few from the community. Of note, of the 36 UPMC-owned senior facilities, we have had zero positive cases. Our outcomes are similar to the state of Pennsylvania, where the median age of death from COVID is 84 years old. The few younger patients who died in our hands all had significant pre-existing conditions. Very few children were infected and none died. Minorities in our communities fared equally as well as others, but we know that this is not the case nationally. In sum, this is a disease of the elderly, sick, and poor. We are now actively bringing back our patients for essential care following CMS guidelines. To assure a safe environment, we use adequate PPE and test all, even asymptomatic, preoperative patients for viral infection. To date, zero out of over a thousand patients have tested positive in our hospitals in Western Pennsylvania. What I thought I might do is let's go on and hear from our last panelists and then I'll come back to you for the first question and give you a chance to elaborate a little bit on um, some of the themes that you were, you were addressing. Um, so uh, the next up, uh, Dr. Uh, Ioannidis, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Senator. <clears throat> Thank you for the very kind invitation to join prestigious colleagues in this panel and to share some thoughts uh, uh, with uh, uh, influential leaders. COVID-19 represents a major crisis with major loss of life. There's no doubt about it. We should use the best science in a data-driven, evidence-based approach to minimize human loss from this pandemic. We need to consider both the benefits and the harms of each of our policy interventions and to adjust our interventions according to continuous feedback with reliable data. Shelter in place and lockdown orders were justified initially when announcements declared a new contagious virus with 3.4% fatality rate and practically no asymptomatic infections. Prospects of 16 million deaths worldwide led to comparisons against 1918 influenza. However, currently, we know that asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic infections are extremely common. The numbers of people infected are far more than those documented to date with PCR testing. Infection fatality rate is accordingly much, much lower than the crude fatality rates derived from dividing the number of deaths by the number of documented cases. While this is a contagious virus and many people can be infected, to date, person years of life loss from COVID-19 worldwide is probably in the range of 100 to 1,000 fold less than the person years of life loss from influenza in 1918. Of course, a second wave cannot yet be excluded. Its occurrence and potential magnitude can only be speculated with mathematical models, but models unfortunately have not been very successful so far in COVID-19 predictions. Therefore, we need to proceed with caution in lifting lockdown and monitor the impact of any changes in policy measures with real data as opposed to just using models. The fatality rate from COVID-19 is highly dependent on age and is also modulated by the presence of comorbidities. For children and young adults, it appears that infection fatality rate is lower than seasonal influenza. And for middle-aged adults, it is about the same. Infection fatality rate can increase sharply, however, when nursing homes are massively infected and when unprepared hospitals are overwhelmed and the infection spreads to hospitalized patients becoming nosocomial infection. This explains the paradox why COVID-19 is typically a very mild, benign infection, but it also has the potential to become devastating in very specific settings. While shelter in place and lockdowns were justified initially, their perpetuation may risk many lives. Unemployment may create more marginalized citizens without health insurance. Mental health can be affected with increases in depression, suicides, domestic violence, and child abuse. Gun sales have increased. Famine and starvation is becoming a global threat. Moreover, deaths from common chronic diseases and treatable conditions such as heart attacks may increase as patients avoid hospitals, interaction with their caregivers is disrupted, and hospitals become financially devastated. Excess deaths accruing during COVID-19 weeks may reflect both COVID-19 itself, but also deaths from healthcare disruption. COVID-19 overwhelmed a few dozen hospitals, while COVID-19 measures may jeopardize services and multiple health outcomes in thousands of hospitals. Moving forward, 
we need to defend hospitals and nursing homes with strict infection control and hygienic measures, universal and periodic testing of all personnel, and quarantine for infected and exposed personnel. Conversely, we should reassure most citizens, especially those of younger or middle age without serious pre-existing conditions, that they are at extremely low risk. Reopening efforts required great caution with continuous feedback to identify and limit any potential surge of hospitalizations and deaths upon reopening. Reopening should be gradual with continuous feedback on epidemic activity. This should include data on seroprevalence, the proportion of people already infected, and incidence of new infections. These data should be balanced against bed capacity reserves. It is unrealistic to expect new PCR detected cases to disappear before reopening. PCR remains positive for a while in many patients who are no longer infectious. Moreover, with increased testing and with a large pool of previously undetected infections, numbers of PCR positive samples may seem to remain quite high, even though the epidemic wave has largely passed. It is also unrealistic to expect COVID-19 deaths to stop accruing before reopening. Deaths may happen three weeks after infection and modern medical technology can maintain some people on mechanical support even for months. Finally, it is unrealistic to expect that complete contact tracing will need to be feasible before reopening. In most locations, the number of people infected is already very, very large, and their casual contacts may include a very large portion, if not the large majority of the entire population, thus making complete contact tracing infeasible. Complete contact tracing can be more feasible when the epidemic wave has ceased, for example, in the future when trying to catch early and extinguish potentially new waves. The pace of reopening may differ across locations depending on their evolving levels of infection, hospital capacity, and population vulnerability structure. While treatment advances and vaccine efforts may be successful eventually, lockdown and shelter-in-place measures cannot be prolonged until we find treatments and vaccines that save many lives, since such breakthroughs may take a very long time or may even never happen. For example, remdesivir has shown promising results in shortening duration of disease but no conclusive evidence yet for saving lives. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, doctor. Um, so I'm going to recognize myself for um, some questions and then move on to my colleagues. And I'd like to start with Dr. Shapiro. And doctor, I wonder if you could uh, give us your sense of the healthcare cost that we incur as a society when we uh, prevent the, what we call the uh, elective surgeries and procedures. Uh, my understanding is there's a report that has shown that, for instance, the number of, that the number of uh, cervical cancer screenings performed across the country declined by nearly 70% following the widespread adoption of stay-at-home orders and a prohibition against uh, these uh, elective procedures. Um, well, over the last two decades, cervical cancer rates have declined dramatically, and I think the consensus has been that the screening is why that's been able to decline. So that's one example of the potential uh, adverse outcome that happens from uh, the inability to perform these elective surgeries. Could you comment on how big a concern that is for you for states and regions that continue to prevent hospitals from engaging in these uh, kinds of surgeries and procedures? Uh, yes, well, there, there's no doubt that essential care cannot be deferred for long. Uh, we know we put off taking out tumor masses for a couple of weeks, three weeks, but we know that we can't do that much longer. We do know, we suspect, and we'll find out the consequences later on that heart disease and other problems, uh, we may be seeing them at later stages and patients in, in worse conditions. Uh, so we really do need to get our patients back. There are reports that parents who were afraid to take their children to the hospital uh, because of COVID ended up dying of sepsis, non-related problems. So the problems with non-COVID illness greatly outweigh the, what we're seeing from COVID. And in addition, one of the things I think that was cut off is that even extended social isolation causes adverse mental health consequences in terms of loneliness and that is before the much greater costs of economic devastation take hold of the human condition. Uh, and just to quickly follow up on that, doctor, you, you refer to the, uh, the problems of loneliness. Isn't it true that there's a significant correlation 
uh, between uh, what we call the diseases of despair, including alcohol and drug abuse and suicide, that, that, that those are correlated with extended periods of lack of employment and the perceived lack of opportunity. Um, should, we, uh, should we have reason to fear that we could see an uptick in those, uh, those illnesses and those um, terrible uh, tragedies? We certainly do. The previous Surgeon General, Dr. Murthy, has really made a point to study the effects of loneliness on these uh, diseases of despair. And our behavioral health professionals are really uh, already starting to see the effects of this at the present time and are very concerned about what will happen as we continue. <laughs> Hope he's not talking to me. Uh, Senator, Senator, we can't hear you. <clears throat> I think you're mute, muted, Senator. Can you hear me now? Okay, I I apologize, uh, uh, Dr. Ioannidis. My question is: um, Is there reason to believe that the reported death, uh, the number of deaths reported, might actually be misleading? Because in some cases, uh, people are deemed to have died of COVID-19 when in fact there is no positive test. It is not certain that they had uh, the infection of the virus and it may have contributed in some way, but it was not the primary cause of death. Um, th this um, uh, concern of mine comes from the way the uh, guidance has been given to how to fill out death certificates. I wonder if you could shed any light on that. I think that uh, it is very likely that there's both uh, an undercounting of deaths. And uh, uh, I, I believe that probably overcounting is more prominent in most locations compared to undercounting. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, there's a new category of probable uh, death. And uh, in these cases, we have not documented the presence of the virus. So it's pretty speculated people have died uh, because of uh, COVID-19. We have some more mature data from uh, European countries where the epidemic wave has matured by now. And uh, in Italy, for example, 98 to 99% of people dying with a diagnosis of COVID-19, they had also other causes for death. On average, they had three other causes for death. So uh, it's uh, a bit premature to have the complete picture and some of the deaths would need to be arbitrated even several months, if not years from now, in terms of their exact causality. We would need to look very carefully on medical records reviewed but I suspect that uh, uh, the net contribution of COVID-19 to uh, people dying is much less compared to the crude numbers that are being circulated at the moment. So that has obviously very significant implications. I appreciate that. Um, I'd, I'd like to follow up if we can have time for another round, but at this point, I'm gonna recognize my colleague, Senator Cassidy, for his questions. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry, there's background noise and I have a mask on. So I sound like Darth Vader. Um, uh, Dr. Ioannidis, following up on the last question, I've heard the term excess death as being a measure. If you think of rural areas with less testing, uh, they may not recognize that somebody died of COVID. And yet, uh, you can see that compared to this time a year ago, there would be however many more deaths, 10%, 20% more deaths. What do you think of that method of analysis? I think that uh, looking at excess deaths is a complementary way of uh, examining the impact of the pandemic. Um, obviously, if we see uh, no increase or even a decrease in some areas or even in some uh, entire countries, uh, this argues that uh, clearly the pandemic is very unlikely to have had a substantial impact. Uh, if we see any increase, it depends on how big it is, and we have to take into account that uh, multiple other causes may also change their patterns of mortality during these weeks. Uh, for example, as it was mentioned, uh, people with severe conditions like heart attacks uh, may not go to the hospital. So we may have some excess deaths uh, from other conditions that need to be taken into account. Uh, it is one other piece of information that we have. And uh, even though you will see some locations uh, that have very high spikes of excess deaths, you will see many others 
that have no spike at all or even a trough. And uh, this argues uh, along the lines of what I suggested that maybe we are overcounting on average the number of deaths. Let me ask you this. You mentioned we can't wait for all deaths to go away, but should we wait for R naught to be below one, figuring that if R naught is above one when we have a lockdown, uh, uh, what will happen when we cease to have a lockdown, R naught would begin to more rapidly increase? What are your thoughts on that? I think that we need a reliable data for calculating uh, R0, uh, because if we just uh, uh, look at the number of cases that are being documented, we have to take into account that there is uh, an increase in testing. Uh, more people get tested, there's better testing capacity, and you need to disengage and uh, disentangle uh, the increased number of cases documented because of more testing versus increased number because of really more cases happening, new infections. I think if we have more representative data, on incidents, and if we repeat those on a representative sample every week or two weeks, uh, it doesn't have to be the entire population. It has to be a very small sample compared to the entire population. We can get, have a better sense of the epidemic activity. Uh, and uh, I would suspect that uh, the epidemic activity currently uh, has declined practically everywhere in Europe and uh, almost everywhere, if not everywhere, in the United States. Now, let me ask you about that, because I've been thinking about a term my friend uses called micro-communities. If we think about schools, children have classically been vectors of disease. We know they're much less likely to be symptomatic. So as we speak about opening schools, my concern is if R0 is not less than one in the community from which those children come, then they will be effective vectors to spread the disease not just among themselves, but back to the households, the communities where their fellow students come from. What are your thoughts on that? What we know is that uh, children have practically a negligible risk of uh, getting serious disease and practically a zero risk of dying, except for children that have severe immunodeficiencies or, or major health problems. Uh, I think that it is a good step to try to open schools and to monitor the impact of that change in policy uh, by tracking what happens to the uh, prevalence and incidence of the infection. And of course, uh, knowing that we have uh, excellent bed capacity, it, one can never be sure that uh, it will be perfectly fine, but there's a very good chance that it will be a step that uh, will have no negative impact. And conversely, it will have uh, a lot of a positive impact because of the, old, the adverse consequences that you have by closing schools and by having children stay with uh, elderly uh, relatives and uh, exposed frail individuals uh, at homes or in other settings outside of school. In opening schools, we need to give the opportunity for teleeducation to uh, teachers who are above a given age, to uh, people who have disease, you know, teaching personnel who have disease, and also to children who live with uh, people who are frail and uh, maybe at high susceptibility. So I, I think we need to have a consideration of a hybrid system where schools are open, but we give the option to uh, all of these uh, uh, subgroups and of course to anyone who doesn't want to get exposed to have the possibility of continuing with teleeducation. Now I'm going to disagree with you a little bit because I do think that children, uh, again we know from Israel with hepatitis A for example, tend to spread disease among themselves uh, and, uh, and do infect elderly or not just elderly, people over their parents. We can look at pneumococcal disease as another example of vaccinating the child and protecting the elderly. So let me go to Dr. Romer and McClellan. Uh, Mark, you and I had spoken a while ago. You were a little skeptical about the utility of antibodies. It sounds like you're a convert. Uh, but this question will be addressed to both you and Dr. Romer. Uh, we do a lot of testing. The individual has their own information, but it does seem we don't achieve the true utility of that information on a societal basis, unless we track it on a societal basis, much as we do immunization histories. Uh, as an example, if we have an outbreak of measles, we know the relative risk of the population based upon how many have been immunized, which is to say um, uh, uh, either born before 1957 or vaccinated. We take those two numbers to calculate immunity, not just the immunization rate, but born before 1957. So is it, a complementary to having widespread testing to also be documenting who is tested, et cetera. Either one of you guys. 
Um, Senators, uh, Dr. McClellan, I'll st Mark McClellan, I'll, I'll start. Um, uh, and I think one of, I, I would like to tie this into the discussion we were just having about community spread. Um, I, like everyone else, would like to see schools reopen as quickly as possible. It's gonna have to happen, I think, under modified conditions to reduce spread, not because there's a big risk to the kids, fortunately, with this pandemic, but because, as you said, there's pretty clear evidence that they are, they can be vectors of spread back into the community to their parents and to others. And that gets us back to the importance of testing. Uh, with more availability of tests, including tests that are used for surveillance, uh, for especially in communities that have some active evidence of spread, that is gonna be very helpful for containing further outbreaks. And where we're hopefully headed, uh, Dr. Cassidy, is to having not only more widespread availability of reliable testing that could plug into the kind of uh, tracking systems that, that you describe, but also reliable serologic tests for people who do have immunity. We're not there yet on the science for serology, either for fully understanding, as you know, uh, how long antibody um, responses persist and what exactly those antibody responses mean for chance of transmissibility and for immunity. Hopefully that science will come along quickly with the recent legislation that Congress passed on this topic. And we're not there yet with the reliability of uh, reliable serologic tests uh, to give people confidence that they can make those kinds of decisions. Hopefully we'll see progress there too. So my point was just uh, as we develop these systems like you're describing, I think we're also gonna need to rely for a while on significant increases in testing for the presence of COVID-19 uh, as uh, these uh, serology tests come along. And even with the uh, much bigger prevalence of COVID-19 in some of the big outbreak communities in the United States than we've been able to detect so far, it's still only a, a minority and probably a small minority of the population in most urban areas and certainly in most of the United States. So it's not the only strategy. If I could just weigh in here, I, I think um, you, you'd clearly like decision makers at all levels to have access to information that can guide their decisions. There are uh, decision makers at state level and national level who could benefit from better aggregated data from these tests. But there are many decisions that happen at the individual level and the smaller scale level that could also be guided in a very beneficial way by data about tests. Just oh, about the decision to go visit an elderly uh, relative in a nursing home, if that were allowed. If I know that I'm infected, I'm not gonna go visit my mom in a, in a nursing home. So we could find a way to make that uh, information available to me, perhaps with some home testing, perhaps in a way that you know nobody else can verify, I can still act on that. In the same way, I think um, the, the steps that Massachusetts has taken to test everybody, all the residents in a nursing home can provide very valuable information within the nursing home to help you know, stop the spread of uh, these, these really terrible uh, infections and deaths in the homes. And they may wanna do this with their, their staff as well. Even if we don't have a system that aggregates that information up to the state or national level, helping those decision makers know who's infected and who's not can be very valuable. Hey, hey Tom, Cassidy, uh, 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 yeah, I'm going to uh, just interrupt for a moment. I'm going to have to vote soon. I think you've already voted. Is that correct, Senator Cassidy? Okay. Yeah. So I know Dr. Shapiro had a comment he wanted to make, so I want to let him do that. And then I, I'd like to uh, just ask a couple of quick questions, and then I'm going to have to run and vote. Dr. Okay. Shapiro? Just very briefly, I think one of the points that we were trying to make that was probably cut out is it is true that children might get infected and they won't get very sick from it. But the way to protect society while keeping it open is to really isolate and protect the vulnerable seniors. If we could keep them out of harm's way, we can continue. I think the example of the U.S. Theodore Roosevelt where 1,100 patients were infected and only one died. Yes, they can spread it among themselves, but they'll be fine as long as we keep our seniors protected and other vulnerable populations. Thanks. Thank you, doctor. Uh, it's a very important point. Um, I'd like to shift to Dr. McClellan. Um, my understanding is that uh, you have been um, consulting with um, the governor of Texas, and Texas has taken an interesting approach to the uh, reopening there. 
Um, my understanding is that while it is a, a gradual phased reopening, it is not so much regional, it's rather uh, statewide, and it does include um, types of businesses that in many other states are uh, assumed to be opening in a later phase, like restaurants, for instance. So I wonder if you could share with us your thoughts about the, the advantages of doing a statewide reopening of the sort that Texas is pursuing, pursuing versus a more regional, localized approach that other states are pursuing. Uh, Senator, the uh, governor of Texas has, I think, done a, a really uh, important job in setting up his reopening plan by having public-private collaboration through task forces to engage different types of businesses. So we talked about earlier, they're going to have to do things differently for this to succeed, to engage the public, they're going to have to do things differently, and to have healthcare advisors and public health advisors. So I am part of that group. Uh, we have recommended a phased approach, and because Texas has had relatively low levels of cases so far, that gives them some room in terms of the healthcare capacity and in terms of impact in the community uh, to, uh, to take these steps now. I do think going forward, it's important to emphasize the point that you made at the beginning, gradual reopening. And we don't yet know, as you've heard from the other panelists, exactly what policies are going to be best for containing spread in the community and especially protecting those at higher risk for complications for COVID-19. So while the governor has started with opening a broader range of businesses, I think it's very important in this process for the expansion to be gradual. You're only going to see cases like um, uh, uh, hospitalizations and other complications show up with a lag. Um, sort of a week or two weeks after you take a reopening step. People are understandably going to be gradual in their own responses. As, uh, as Dr. Romer said, they're, if, if they don't feel safe, they're not going to get back to uh, going out to movies or other things like that. So, so gradual approach and caution is really important. And Texas may well need to, to pause or, or stop activities in certain regions of the state uh, if there are bigger outbreaks. Uh, we're still in the early days of figuring out how to reopen, and I think the, the, the approach of uh, a gradual uh, approach, and I think including significant increases in testing, uh, which I wish was in place right now in Texas, but they're working really hard to get up to, uh, get up to speed along the lines that Dr. Romer was describing too, uh, I think that'll help uh, for this to succeed. But it's early days and we need to be cautious. Thanks, Dr. McClellan. Uh, I'm going to recognize Senator Portman for his questions. And uh, Senator Portman, I'm going to run and vote. So between you and Senator Cassidy, if you could uh, just carry the ball on this, uh, I would appreciate it. That would be great. Pat, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Great. Thanks so much. And I appreciate uh, your doing this. We, we had a remote uh, roundtable discussion last week uh, that went well until um, we had some feedback and we had to cut out that part of it. Uh, but uh, these technological challenges will be figured out. And uh, I think it's really positive that you're doing this. And I thank all the witnesses as well for giving us some of their input. I was on earlier. I ran over and voted already, Pat. So um, I'll be in a position to to listen and, and, and uh, ask questions. Um, Dr. Romer, I, I found your comments fascinating in terms of this uh, population testing issue. Uh, you basically are saying that uh, you know, we need to have the capacity to test a lot more people. Uh, can you give us some specificity on that? In other words, is it 500,000 to a million people per day? Uh, is it more or less? Today, the capabilities, I understand it, in, in most of our states uh, is far less than that. We have about uh, 250,000 people per day who could be tested. Can you tell us more about what is actually happening, who is actually being tested today? Um, I will say that in Ohio, we've gone from testing about 3,700 people per day as of two weeks ago to uh, being able to test up to 22,000 people per day within three weeks. And that happens to coincide with our reopening, which, which I like. I'm a fan of reopening. I'm also a fan of doing it safely. Uh, but if you could give us a little sense of what you're talking about. When, when you say uh, that we should have population testing that's uh, broad enough to be able to track uh, the scope of the virus and do the contact tracing, what are you talking about specifically? Yeah. So um, uh, to start, 
I was speaking in the beginning about 23, between 20 and 25 million tests per day as the goal we would have to hit if we wanted to test everybody in the United States every two weeks. And I tried to argue that that would be worth doing, even though it's a huge you know, uh, effort to get to that level. But I think it's also useful to pull back and say that each additional um, unit of capacity we have for testing can be very helpful. And think about what Mark was, was just saying, that you'd like to open up in Texas, but you're worried that it might be raising um, R0. If you're using test and isolate to drive R0 down, then you got the freedom to let more people uh, engage in mobility and things and keep the overall level of R0 uh, below one. So, uh, so that each incremental unit of testing that you have can be used to safely uh, free up a bunch of people who are right now very constrained. Uh, I, I think you, know, you should think of um, committing to, to test, and I'll produ I'm producing these numbers right now based on a sort of a standard model here. I, I think uh, each kind of level of testing that we do, say for a year, 26 tests in a year, um, this can free up something like 15 people who are free to, to go back to work and you get um, uh, still no effect on, on R0. Of course, you could use those say 26 tests a year just to reduce the death rate, but you've got a choice. You either reduce the death rate or you hold R0 constant, but you free up people from, from restrictions. So I think the payoff in terms of you know, 15 extra jobs, 15 extra instances of, of median income, this is very large compared to the cost of doing those 26 tests in a year. And so I think we should be thinking about just scaling up testing as quickly as we can and simultaneously thinking about where can we get the biggest uh, bang for the buck um, from using those. I, I think, for example, that in testing uh, all of the staff um, in hospitals, this could be a very important measure for getting people to come back in and bring their kids in to get the, the vaccines, have the elective procedure, like the scan for, uh, for cancer. Right now, if people are afraid that you know, some percentage of the hospital staff are, are still infected, they're not gonna wanna come in and you know, frequent testing of hospital staff could help remove that concern on the part of the, the, the patients. As I mentioned, I think nursing homes are very promising places to substantially reduce uh, fatalities with um, more testing. And those lower fatalities may actually help give others the confidence to, to go back and, and go to work. So in summary, I think for 100 billion a year, we could get to 23 million tests a day, which means test everybody every 14 days. But even if we just add a, a million tests a day, I think that testing everybody in nursing homes, this only takes um, about 175, 185,000 uh, tests uh, per week. So um, you know, each additional unit of testing, if we deploy it to save lives or to free up people to go back to work, it would have just enormous uh, value for society. Yeah, I, so those numbers are huge. So uh, the 25 million number would be uh, enough to have everybody get a test every two weeks, 25 million tests a day, is that correct? Yeah, but, but I mean, okay. think of the first million tests a day we could add and just think about the huge value that well, would I, generate. I, I, don't, I don't disagree. I think okay. the $25 billion that was in uh, 3.5, which was the most recent CARES uh, legislation, uh, was set aside for testing, was money very well spent and probably, in my view, better spent than the other funding uh, because of the impact it's going to have on the economy. Uh, maybe someone else could talk to us a little about other institutions other than the nursing homes and the hospitals where there's a clear need to have regular testing. And I agree with you, people will feel more comfortable coming forward. I think how Dr. About, Shapiro was trying to jump in. Um, okay, Dr. Shapiro. How about, how about talk, talk to me a little about nursing homes, but also, and, and hospitals, but also about movie theaters and bowling alleys and bars and restaurants where we have a, obviously a huge issue. What would be the norm there in terms of testing? And, and I know this is not necessarily the expertise of of, of the physicians on the panel, but what is what is that likely to do? Going back to the I think one of the things I believe was probably cut off was we are testing all of our patients who are coming back for procedures. 
-hmm. And in Western Pennsylvania, New York, and Maryland, we have zero of over 1,000 patients tested, three of 500 in Central Pennsylvania. So while we might want to do testing at large numbers for places like New York, in areas like ours where the virus and the r naughts probably low, and we even think seasonality may play a role, we probably don't need to do as extensive testing. We know it's very low. When we call patients asymptomatic, we often use a cutoff for 100 for uh, their, their temperature. In our nursing homes, the reasons we don't have any infections is because we use a cutoff of 99. So even without extensive testing in certain areas of the country where the prevalence is low and we're much better at screening for symptoms, we probably don't need as much testing. If the community level is low, that will have implications for the movie theaters and everything else. Uh, mm -hmm. They may want to have a temperature outside of the movie theater, uh, but I think the combination of those measures in specific areas with low prevalence and particularly this time of year where the virus might not be too healthy might be enough as we get therapy for a potential surge in the fall. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Good, good, good points. And, and this is a regional issue, even within states. Pennsylvania is a great example of that. As Ohio, we're in a rural areas, we've had relatively fewer cases, even as a percent of population in our urban areas where people are living more closely and, and more congregate living. Um, Dr. McClellan, anyone else want to answer this question about testing and the psychology of testing and, and what it could mean in terms of not just reopening our economy, but really getting our economy moving again. It's a consumer-based economy after all. So to the extent people feel comfortable going back to shops and back to restaurants and back to the movie theaters, uh, much more likely that we can get the economy back again where we have revenue coming into the federal government we need desperately and where the back to the hospitals will begin to get their revenue back and small businesses can open their doors again. But Dr. McClellan, any thoughts? Um, I think that's right, uh, Senator Portman. Consumer confidence that they can go out safely and not worry about a high risk of transmission, either for themselves or a, or a loved one, is going to be very important for success. And I think consumers get the basic idea behind this R naught that we've been discussing. If the number of cases is, is going up in a community and we're seeing cases, that that's a lag of what they're actually being exposed to in terms of potential asymptomatic transmission, uh, that's going to be a real worry and be a real drag on, uh, on economic recovery and also a real drag on uh, protecting the health of the, the population. That's why I think this is not an either or issue. And I think you've heard uh, maybe not the same views from everybody on this panel, but just to pick up on, uh, on Paul's comment uh, a minute ago, uh, we don't have as much completely accurate, easy to do testing as everybody would like to have right now to get us through the pandemic so we know exactly what our status is at all times. Unfortunately, I think we're still a ways away from that despite a lot of progress and efforts in that direction. So the idea of increasing testing with good tests, getting them more out in the community and prioritizing where they should be used. Uh, as you heard, uh, nursing homes, um, uh, food processing plants, other places where people are close together and you can get rapid spread uh, despite the best efforts that businesses are, are undertaking to slow down the spread, uh, I think is the, is the right way uh, to go. Uh, we've got limited testing now. It's varying across the states. I think there's a lot to learn by states looking at experiences of each other uh, and how they're taking uh, effective steps to increase the, the capacity to use tests smartly in the community, in high-risk settings, uh, among people who are hospitalized, as you just heard, um, and in some businesses. But I think for right now and for the foreseeable future, for most businesses, if you're in a low risk area with low contact because you're doing the right things for distancing with your customers and with your employees, probably uh, testing there is not gonna be very high value, especially while uh, the tests we have are limited and imperfect. In contrast, in these higher risk settings, it could be uh, much more important. And I do wanna emphasize the, the importance of involving healthcare providers in this. Our public health system is really trying to stand up around the country to support all of this testing and local surveillance and being able to identify the best way to contain outbreaks in these kind of micro environments that uh, Dr. Cassidy was talking about. But it is, it is a big job. It's uh, orders of magnitude, bigger capacity for identifying where to test, having testing that people will trust and connect with. Healthcare providers are really important complements to 
the public health system in that. CMS took some steps last week to make it easier for healthcare providers to get paid uh, for this testing, not only in hospitals, but in nursing homes, in the community. I think there's more that can be done to build on that. A lot of healthcare providers are so much in financial difficulty right now, they can't even maintain their staff, let alone get actively involved in everything we've talked about today. So thinking about further relief for healthcare providers that's linked to building these population health capabilities to, to protect the public against further outbreaks uh, by getting them more involved in testing and, and effectively using the resources we now have I think is a very important part of going forward uh, so that you get both uh, uh, relief for healthcare providers and recovery. Well, I think that makes sense. Uh, I, I see uh, Chairman Toomey is back. I don't want to exceed my, my time here, but two, two thoughts from what you said. One is based on your comments um, about the healthcare providers, um, it's all related. In other words, until people feel comfortable going back to the emergency room and, and certainly uh, going back to surgeries, which have now opened up in many states, including my own, at least for outpatient and soon for inpatient, there needs to be a level of comfort. And it doesn't matter what a governor says or what a senator says or even what the president says in terms of time to reopen, it will be a consumer decision. People will vote with their feet. It's whether they show up at the hospital or not. And the hospital revenues are not going to come back until there is that level of comfort. Um, so it's, it's important for the healthcare system itself to have not just adequate testing, but the ability to communicate directly to people as to what that testing means in terms of it being safe to venture back out um, and, to, and to, in many cases, get the healthcare that people are avoiding right now. We've talked a lot uh, over the last few weeks about mental health, um, behavioral health, addiction services, treatment, recovery. Uh, much of that has been put off as we have dealt with this crisis and we need to get people back uh, feeling comfortable uh, interacting. By the way, we've also done a lot in terms of telehealth in the meantime, and that's been very positive in my view and, uh, and more cost effective as, as well. So we've probably learned some things about what we can do. In terms of your other, other point on testing and the need for us to make incremental progress so that people feel more comfortable to re-engage with the economy. Um, the issue we've had in Ohio and around the country is that it's fine to say we need more testing, but there's certain bottlenecks, reagents being the largest bottleneck that we've discovered. Uh, swabs is a bottleneck in, in some areas. Uh, if we're gonna do 25 million tests a day eventually, which would be you know one test for every person every couple of weeks, but let's say even go to a million, <laughs> So one twenty-fifth of that from where we are now at about half a million probably. Uh, do we have the, and I, I don't know if Dr. McClellan, you're the right person to answer this question, but someone on the panel, do we have the capability to do that? Are the components available? We rely so heavily on other countries to provide us some of this, um, these inputs, including reagents. Uh, is this a capability that we have? So we're not you know, sort of promising the American people we can add another $50 billion to the next package and ramp up testing dramatically, but, but we find these bottlenecks. Have we gotten, in your views, to the capability as a country where we can provide a higher level of testing? Uh, Senator, if, if, if I could, could I just make one suggestion? I think there's something that Congress could do, the Senate could do, that could be very helpful here. As you know, there's a way to do sampling with saliva, just spit in the tube, yep. instead of having to use the swabs. Right, right now, the FDA won't let um, somebody give a sample that way unless they're under a healthcare professional's supervision when mm -hmm. they spit in the tube. And moreover, they're not even allowing telemedicine to constitute a form of healthcare uh, supervision as they spit in the tube. So I think the FDA is really um, holding back the one thing that could solve this swab uh, shortage. And it would be good if they got the message that, that there's really very little risk here in shifting to the saliva samples. And we ought not be using physical presence with a healthcare professional as a restriction on uh, the use of these saliva tests. And, and if, I, if I could just add, uh, um, you know, having some of that FDA experience myself, I mean, you get it from both sides. So FDA has been criticized, I think with some justification for going too fast on making some tests available that don't have proven 
reliability. You know, that antibody you test and particular confident that they're when it says it's positive, the uh, the disease is really there, the immunity is really there, and when it says yeah. it's negative, it's not. Um, we're getting better at that. Uh, I, I agree about the value to increase the testing capacity we have of being able to move to, to spit-based tests. Uh, uh, that's much easier to do at home. I do think FDA has actually moved in the direction of approving more telemedicine-based tests, but it's important for people who are developing those tests to quickly provide some evidence that it can be done reliably. And that's back to your point about consumers being confident. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, we need to take some steps, reasonable steps in this epidemic to make sure that the tests really do work. And I think we can get there. I also think there's some further improvements coming with uh, so-called uh, next generation sequencing uh, based testing capacity that should be coming online in a matter of weeks. Uh, NIH has put out a, a, a prize for a, a further breakthrough. Um, I don't see exactly what that is yet, but that's why they're putting out a big prize and asking some of the smartest uh, uh, developers to get involved. I think that's a little bit further down. So for the foreseeable future, if we want to reopen this month, next month, the next few months, I think we need to rely on testing that's higher than what we have now, but, but probably not getting close to that uh, 25, 30 million per day level, where we, we do need to be a, a bit smart and uh, very thoughtful about giving, putting the test capacity where it's most needed and using that to help guide our further steps on, on reopening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Senator Portman, thanks very much for joining us. Um, I, I think- uh, uh, Dr. Ioannidis, I think you wanted to make a point. I want to recognize you, give you a chance to make that point, and then I'm going to ask a final question um, and ask uh, everybody who'd like to to weigh in on it. But Dr. Anidis. I think it is very important to have uh, uh, the best possible testing capacity so that we build confidence in the population. At the same time, uh, we don't really need to escalate our capacity that much if we go with a strategy that uses uh, epidemiologic surveillance and sentinel testing in representative samples of the population. Instead of testing uh, 1 million people in a population, one can test a representative sample of 1,000 people. And if there's no activity uh, or you know, very, very little activity, there's no need to expand testing aggressively for that population. In some locations, it may be different. Maybe we see that with that representative sample uh, results, uh, we see a lot of activity that is emerging, and then we need to step up our testing capability within that particular state or within that particular location. If we, if we do that, we don't really need to go to uh, tens of millions of tests uh, run every day. We can do it probably even with less than a million tests every day. We need to protect hospitals. We need to protect nursing homes, other locations. When uh, things can go wrong, we can get a massacre. And I think aggressive universal testing in these locations is important. But for the rest of the population, I think that representative testing makes, makes much more sense, it is far more efficient, and it can be complemented with aggressive, more expanded testing only in the locations when this is necessary. Thank you. Um, so I, I really appreciate your uh, taking the time to join us today, uh, to all our panelists, um, to the senators that joined us. Thank you so much for your patience when we had our technological uh, challenge there. I appreciate your um, hanging with us. Um, I'd like to close with uh, a, a thought that I have and your reaction to it, and maybe Dr. Shapiro could kick this off and, and others can um, uh, say uh, what, uh, what is on their mind. But sometimes uh, people suggest, when I've suggested that we begin the process of a careful, thoughtful, safe reopening of our economy, People have suggested, well, the problem with that is we'll be right back where we were before with this uh, danger of this out of control virus. But it strikes me that in fact, today in early May, we are vastly ahead of where we were in say February. Uh, we're vastly ahead in terms of our understanding of the nature of the virus, how it's transmitted, the nature of the disease. We've made progress. Uh, with respect to therapies, we have demonstrated that we've got tremendous capacity. We have adopted social distancing behaviors that I don't think are going to go away soon. So it seems to me by uh, virtually every meaningful measure, we're in a much, much better position now as, as a society to deal with this. And a week from now, we'll be better off than we are today. And a month from now, we'll be better off still. 
because we're making progress on every front. And so I think that we have every reason to be very optimistic that probably the worst is behind us, that we can begin the process of getting back to living our lives, and that we'll be able to manage our way through this, despite the fact that it is obviously a terrible tragedy in the isolated cases uh, that, uh, that we know will inevitably occur. But my fundamental thought is that we've made tremendous progress and we're gonna keep making progress and we should be really optimistic a a about the future. I, I wonder what your thoughts are on this and Dr. Shapiro, I'll turn to you first. I think those are great points. The r naught is low in part from social distancing and probably because of some seasonality as well that we don't talk about as much. But the case rates are so low in most of the country that with isolation, protection of seniors and other vulnerable populations, we can start to come out safely. And if there is any sort of resurgence, we can catch it early with uh, tracing, tracking, testing. We can, we can keep it under control. We're not gonna cure this right now, but I think we can buy ourselves some time to lead normal lives while we wait for the uh, antibodies vaccines. And the antibodies, I believe, will be here by late fall if there is a resurgence. So I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Dr. McClellan, I, I know you're on a tight schedule here. Do you have any thoughts on this issue? Well, thank you. And, and I, I too am an optimist by nature. And, and I'd, I'd call it, uh, for me, though, cautious optimism at this point. We have made tremendous progress. It's been amazing how much Americans have responded. And uh, the congressional action has helped tremendously in, in enabling us to be in a position we are now. On the other hand, we're still seeing a plateau in the level of cases with some concerns that that may rise if we don't do things right uh, as a reopening occurs. Uh, still at 30,000 cases per day, still having some outbreaks in these uh, very high risk settings as, uh, as you just heard about from Dr. Shapiro. So there are a lot of ifs uh, in this optimism. And I, I would encourage, uh, just as we've talked about today, a continued focus on getting the effective testing and follow-up capacity up. Uh, we're getting there, but we're not there, there yet. Um, second is not a relenting in recognizing that we are in a new normal, or I guess a new um, not so normal in terms of the way businesses and, uh, and, and all Americans really need to, to interact and, until we're more confident that the steps we're taking really are preventing those further outbreaks and, and, and deaths and, uh, and complications and keeping that confidence that uh, Senator Portman was talking about. And I would just add an extra push on this point about the new health care. Uh, we can't go back to health care the way it was either. I know healthcare providers are struggling in many parts of the country today, but we really need to support them in taking new steps to enable not just uh, confidence when people go in to get their procedures, but to work with public health authorities and out in the community to reach people. Doctors and the health professionals are the ones that they trust about uh, interpreting test results, about uh, helping them to, to know what to do if they have symptoms, they should be staying home, but, but they should be getting help and, and being diagnosed and, and not having to disrupt their lives too much. Uh, and healthcare providers need to deliver care differently. Uh, it's true that a lot of people aren't getting urgent services that they need, but there is a lot of care that can be delivered via telemedicine and out there at home in the community that people are actually finding is, is better. So maybe a little silver lining there, but to make that stick, I, I think there needs to be some con con additional continued congressional attention to helping us move to this new kind of healthcare system that's better at population health and that's better at giving care in the community too. Thanks, Dr. McClellan. Uh, Dr. Ioannidis? I'm also a cautious uh, optimist in this uh, situation. Obviously, um, we've uh, had a, a major crisis and we're still going through that crisis, but uh, all the indicators that we have accumulated over the last uh, three months suggest that uh, our expectations can be more optimistic because many of the original predictions were based on very inflated estimates of uh, uh, mortality <coughs> and uh, fatality of this virus. I think that we need to take one step at a time. Uh, currently, the risk benefit, the ratio for prolonging long lockdown measures and shelter in place seems to be very unfavorable, even with uh, the more pessimistic uh, uh, prospects about uh, potential resurgence of the virus if we start reopening our society. We need to try, we need to use the best science, we need to use continuous feedback from indicators of activity and bed capacity, but uh, I hope that we will do very well and uh, that uh, 
uh, we will have very good results by a reopening strategy that is cautiously driven by the best science and best data. Thanks, Dr. Ioannidis. Uh, and Dr. Romer, you get the last word. Okay, I, I think, Senator, the way you framed it is exactly the right way for us to think about this. There are some measures, think about, we, we don't shake hands anymore. Those may per persist indefinitely, and to the extent that those are what have reduced are uh, not, then we shouldn't be worried about opening up. There are some other measures like not going to sit down restaurants, where um, uh, you know, if we do go back to normal, we'll go back to those restaurants. If that's what's part of keeping or not down, then if we go back to restaurants, we got a problem. So we need to understand what's the balance of those two. And then we need to be sure and find what are some additional things like the, the don't shake hands that we can stick with uh, indefinitely because when those lower are not, they let us do things like go back to the restaurants, which might pose a little bit of risk. Test and isolate is one of those things that could be like uh, shaking hands. Test and trace could be another version of that, but we need to keep looking for things we can do permanently that kind of are on the plus side of the scale so that then we can freely uh, uh, return to the things that might have some, uh, you know, some effect in, in reducing, uh, sorry, in increasing or not. Thank you, Dr. Romer. And, and once again, let me thank all of the panelists uh, for your really very, very insightful and very interesting observations and thoughts. Uh, I appreciate it very much. Uh, this concludes our call. Have a terrific day. <laughs>